grace, mercy, and peace from him who chose you to be his very own, dear fellow redeemed. In 1977, televangelist Oral Roberts had a vision from God of a 900-foot-tall Jesus, and this Jesus told him he was to build a 60-story hospital. The hospital was to be built in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it was going to be uniting medical technology with faith healing in order to find a cure for cancer. Four years later, that hospital was built, a 60-story behemoth rising about 600 feet higher than any other building on the outskirts of town. And as you might have guessed, no cure for cancer was ever found. And because a 60-story hospital is totally unnecessary, most of the floors were never used. The hospital lost money at about $10 million per year, and Oral Roberts found himself in financial trouble. But he had another vision. This time, Jesus told him to tell his television audience that they needed to raise $8 million for Oral Roberts, or else the Lord was going to take him from this earth in March of the next year. Followers didn't want to put that to the test. And so, dutifully, they raised the $8 million fee. And at the same time, Mr. Roberts found a, sell, uh, found a buyer for the hospital, sold it, and made some of his money back. Now that hospital is the Cityplex Tower, just another office building in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Did God tell Oral Roberts these things? Did God really want him to build a 60-story tower and then, uh, then also tell him to get these uh, $8 million in offerings from the people? No, that didn't happen. We know that because in Deuteronomy chapter 18, God says that when a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord and it does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. These two examples from Oral Roberts are just two of many examples in which people make a false claim that their ideas or desires are actually coming from God. It's not just televangelists that do this, however. It's also ordinary, everyday, common folk like you and me. People love to make bold claims about what God thinks or what God likes, saying things like, God wants me to be happy. Or, my God loves everyone and he wouldn't judge you. Or, I think that God, fill in the blank. What, what is God like? What does God think? What does God want? Well, it gives us the answer to all those questions in the Bible. He tells us what he thinks. He tells us exactly what he's like, and he tells us with a certainty what he wants. None of that is left up for us to decide or to think about. God tells us the answers. Now, if you tell someone what God is like, of course, based on what he tells us in Scripture, if you tell someone what God is like, they might come back to you and say, well, that's your God. That's not my God, as if God is some possession that might change from person to person. In contrast with that idea, we just confessed our faith just a moment ago, saying, I believe in God the Father. We're not saying, I think that God is like this. Rather, through the, through the Apostles' Creed and every confession that we make, what we are claiming is, this is who God says he is. And he chose to be mine. We'll keep that theme in mind as we consider our text from 1 Peter chapter 1, the first two verses. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to, Christ, to, to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Many years ago when Jess and I were just pretty early on in our dating, she asked me one night if, 
if I had any funny movies that she and a friend could borrow to watch. And I gave her the movie that I thought was just about the funniest in the world. It was uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, if you've ever seen that. She watched it, returned it the next day, and I asked her if she liked the movie, and she said, oh yeah, they both thought it was really funny. Imagine my surprise years later after we were married, and I asked her if she wanted to watch it with me, and she groaned. And I said, but you like that movie. And she told me she didn't actually like it. She just told me she liked it because she liked me. This is, uh, I'm not trying to throw Jess under the bus. We both laughed about this, and I asked her if I could share that with you. It's just a minor example of something that we all do almost every single day. When we don't speak what we really believe. This happens all the time. Sometimes it's innocent, like in that situation. Other times it can be quite serious, like when you see something dangerous happening and you think, you really think it probably shouldn't be taking place, but you don't say anything, and then it gets serious when a bad accident occurs. As a general rule of thumb, it's good to just state what you believe, depending on the situation, of course. That's really what a creed is. It's a statement of what you believe to be true. We have three such creeds in the Church of the Lutheran Confession. The Apostles' Creed, which we just said. We say it every single Sunday. We're studying it today. The Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed. Both of those are longer than the Apostles' Creed. And you can find them both in the front part of your hymnal. In all three creeds, we're saying the same thing. What we believe to be true about God. Now, what makes these creeds different than any other area of life where we're stating what we believe is these creeds are not opinion. They are facts. Yeah, they're written by a human being at one time, but they're based exclusively on what God tells us about himself. So, again, when we confess together, I believe in God the Father, we're not saying, I think that God is like this. We're confessing what God, God himself tells us to be true. In our text this morning, God proclaims certain truths about himself. And this is a really convenient text to use when we're studying the Apostles' Creed because it's divided in the same way. Three parts, one part designated for each member of the Trinity. When we use the Apostles' Creed, we are confessing to be true what God tells us about himself. Namely, that he is triune. A three-in-one God. One God, three persons. Kind of a difficult concept to wrap our brains around, isn't it? One God, but three persons. We know there's only one God because he tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One God. He tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So yes, there is only one God. And yet, throughout Scripture, as we know that there's only one God, God reveals himself to be three distinct persons named the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Genesis chapter 1, at creation, we can read about how in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And yet just a few verses later, it says the Holy Spirit was also there, hovering on the face of the waters. In John chapter 1, we read about the Word. It says, in the beginning, in the beginning of time, the Word was there. The Word was God. And then in verse 14 of that chapter, it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only Son of God. So from the very beginning, there was one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are other passages in scripture that join these three together in close proximity, stating them as a unit. Like in the last chapter of Matthew, when Jesus says, Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So yes, there is only one God, and there are three persons within that Godhead. That's what Peter is confessing in our text this morning as he names all three members of God. And he reveals another important truth to us, that while God is one and there's three distinct persons, those three people of God 
all have distinct roles to play for the same purpose, for the same goal. We'll read about those roles. Those who are elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. So if we're to put titles to these different jobs, they are election, that's the role of the Father, sanctification, that's the job of the Holy Spirit, justification, that's what God the Son, Jesus Christ, does. Three different persons, three different roles, all with one distinct goal and purpose, to save you. We'll come back to that later. Well, it's interesting that Peter is the one writing these words. It's interesting that Peter is the one giving this, this confession, this creed. Because think about what Peter had done on the night which Jesus was betrayed. Three times he was given the opportunity to confess his Savior. Three times Peter was given the opportunity to say that this Jesus is the Son of God. And three times he cursed and swore that he did not know the man. Three times he denied his Savior. And he realized it, and he went out and wept bitterly. But then after Jesus arose, he found Peter again, and he restored him. He told him once more, follow me. Imagine how this must have felt to Peter. Try and put yourself in his shoes. Here, he, here was his teacher, his Lord, the one he spent every day for three years with. And there at his hour of utmost need, as he's about to be wrongfully con, con, uh, condemned and put to death, what does Peter do? He denies knowing him to anyone who would listen. And then Jesus dies. And that's the last thing that Peter did. Then he rises again, and Peter knows now for, for a certainty that this Jesus really was God. And he had denied knowing God. And then Jesus comes to Peter and tells him, follow me. He looks at Peter and essentially says, your sin, yes, it was terrible. But your sin is forgiven. Jesus would not deny Peter, although Peter had done the opposite. This free, undeserved forgiveness, this overwhelming display of love from his Savior, that must have been on the forefront of Peter's mind for the rest of his life. And so it's no surprise where here, as he's writing this text, he confesses Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Where he'd failed to do it before, he was doing it now because those three had worked together to forgive him his sins, to earn his salvation. We are all Peter. We are in the same shoes. How often do we deny our Savior? Maybe you don't curse and swear and, and tell everyone you know that you do not know who Jesus is. But how often when we are given the opportunity to share our faith and to speak about Christ... We retreat to the safety of silence instead. Maybe you've never told someone specifically that you are a believer or made a claim that you were an unbeliever. But perhaps by your actions, no one would be able to tell that you were a Christian at all. If this is you, you also are guilty of denying Christ, just like Peter did. And yet along with him, we confess to believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because just like with Peter, God looks at you and announces, your sins are forgiven. Your iniquity has been covered by Christ's blood. And that's what the three parts of Peter's creed are about. Let's look at those more in depth now. First, in connection with the Father, Peter addresses those who are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That word foreknowledge it comes from the Greek word prognosis, and I assume you've heard that word before. When you speak about a doctor's prognosis, you're asking the doctor what his best educated guess is about your future well-being. 
God's prognosis is not an educated guess. He knows. From the beginning of time, he knew you as his dear children. He knew you to be his very own. And so from the beginning of time, he wrote your name in the book of life. He chose you to be his very own. When we look at the Holy Spirit, we read, in the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Go back to the Father for a second. The teaching that we were speaking of when God chooses us to be saved, that's called predestination. And with predestination, sometimes the question comes up, if God chose me to go to heaven, why do I go to church? Why do I read God's word? Why do we need to take the Lord's Supper if it's just going to happen anyways? Well, God chooses us. He elects us in connection with the working of the Holy Spirit. Think about during the flood. God chose Noah and his seven family members to be saved. He chose them to continue the, the, the population of the world. But he didn't just kind of pick them up and hold them in the air until the flood had subsided. He used means. He used a giant wooden boat to save them, even though he had chosen them to be saved. Same sort of thing here with us. God chooses us, and he uses means. So the Holy Spirit comes to us daily through the word of God to strengthen our faith, or perhaps to even create faith. He comes to us in the waters of baptism to create and sustain this faith. He comes to us in the Lord's Supper, to continue to grow and strengthen and nourish our faith and to assure us that our sins have been forgiven. All of this because our Father in Heaven wants to be your God. He wants you to be in Heaven with Him. And then lastly, we learn about the Son of God, where we read, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. God did not elect you to be saved in a vacuum. He decided that for your life to be spared, his own son needed to give up his life in our place. In the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. The three persons of God working together at every stage of human history for one purpose, for your forgiveness and for your salvation. And knowing all that God has done for us, we confess to know him. We state plainly the truths which he has taught us in scripture, not saying, I believe that my God is like this, rather stating the things that God tells us to be true about him because he chose to be ours. And there are going to be more like Oral Roberts. There are going to be more who make bold claims about what God says or what God thinks. We can make some bold claims as well. We can claim boldly, like Paul does in Galatians 2, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. We can make the bold claim as Paul does in Ephesians 1, that Christ chose, that God chose me in Christ from the foundation of the world. And we can boldly announce to the world, as Paul does in 2 Corinthians 1, that God has put his seal on me and has given me his Holy Spirit in my heart as a guarantee. God himself, all three persons, have worked forgiveness and eternal life for you. He chose to be your God. And the result of that is found in the last line of our text. Grace and peace are now multiplied to you. So what a great reason God has given us to confess his name. What a great reason for us to stand up and to say the Apostles' Creed, professing the truths that God reveals us in, to us in Scripture, because he chose to be our God, and he chose us to be his holy people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.